cannabis is changing fast, and you don't have time to waste. MJ BizCon gives you the tools and connections you need to survive and thrive in 2023 and beyond. Join us in Vegas, November 15th to 18th, and you'll find 35,000 power players in cannabis, 1,400 vendors who will fuel your growth, and fact-based insights on election results, growth projections, regulatory reform, and business management. It's your one real shot to gain a competitive edge in cannabis. Get your ticket today at mjbizcon.com and get 10% off with promo code PODCAST. From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. Welcome back to the Cannabis Podcast. This is episode 107. If this is your first visit, well, I hope you're going to enjoy the next 30 or 40 minutes or so when we pile you up with a whole bunch of information about cannabis. Let me remind you this program is intended only for those 19 or older in your jurisdiction and is intended purely for entertainment purposes. You should always consume cannabis responsibly. And on this episode, we are going to recognize the fact that just yesterday was National Truth and Reconciliation Day here in Canada. And to honor that, we're going to talk about some Indigenous-owned cannabis companies in a story from Okanagan Z. We're also talking another story from Okanagan Z. The Health Canada Review is finally about to begin and we're going to give you a little information on the man behind that Cannabis Act review. Did you know that the most profitable cannabis companies in Canada are government? <laughs> a story from MJ Biz Daily on that. And often we'll hear questions from people about how long will my cannabis last? Is there an expiry date for cannabis? Well, we got a story from actually Cannabis Training University on how long will your weed last? And on Cultivar Corner, it's mint cream cake from the folks at BC Black and Doonesbury Farms. A delicious indica. That's coming up for a taste later. All of that and more on episode 107 of the Cannabis Podcast. And before we get too far along, let me thank some subscribers. First of all, Rob. Rob has bought me a bunch of doobies over the last few months, and now I'm pleased to say, Rob, welcome as a subscriber to the Cannabis Podcast. I'm glad you're along for the ride. Also, thanks again for another month from Will, Christine, Kevin, Jordana. Love having you along for the ride as well. If you feel so inclined, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash Cannabis Podcast. Check out all the options, and if you like what you hear and you feel so inclined, you too could buy me a doobie. So let's get to our first story of the day. Yesterday, in Canada, was National Truth and Reconciliation Day. It was our second year of recognizing that day. I was going to say celebrating, but it's certainly not a celebration. It's a recognition of the damage done to Indigenous people across our country for years and years, and how there has to be some effort to recognize and change all of that. So I hope if you were in Canada, you had an opportunity to participate in some of the events yesterday and understand and recognize some of what has happened and what has to happen in the future. And as part of that, the OZ did a story on five Indigenous-owned cannabis companies, and I thought that was an appropriate topic to bring to you today, too. Now, this is a story from OkanaganZ.com, written by my buddy David Wiley. Cannabis has been an economic driver for Indigenous communities across Canada. It's also been part of some Indigenous cultures for many generations. Indigenous-owned and affiliated companies are helping with employment, entrepreneurship and tourism, as well as helping contribute to the cultural conversation happening in Canada. Here are five Indigenous-owned cannabis producers to check out and try. Sugar Cane Cannabis is wholly owned by Williams Lake First Nation, the WLFN. Sugar Cane Cannabis was part of the WLFN's vision to produce the highest quality, small-batch craft cannabis and to make it available to people directly from the facility in which it's grown. Their journey started in 2020, when construction of a 7,000-square-foot purpose-built facility started. In 2022, construction was completed and sugarcane cannabis received its micro-cultivation license. Sugarcane features state-of-the-art cultivation techniques, an industry-leading grow team, and a spectacular boutique retail outlet, offering a truly curated cannabis experience. They're located in Sequepmic Territory in Williams Lake, B.C. Seven Leaf Cannabis Roots and heritage as an Indigenous licensed producer is apparent from the get-go with the name Sovereign, referencing the importance of what it means to have sovereignty and independence as a First Nations community. 
The Akwesasne Gonye Geha Mohawk Territory has a long standing history of geographical complexity. The land straddles both international, U.S. and Canada, and provincial, Ontario and Quebec borders. The name Sovereign works in synergy with the branding, which features topographical renditions of the land shown as a single entity as well as the exact coordinates for the reservation. All Nations is leading the way for meaningful Indigenous participation in the licensed cannabis industry. They aspire to be the world's largest Indigenous cannabis company, delivering prosperity and social impact to the communities where they live and work. All Nations combines BC-grown cannabis, expertise and Indigenous social impact to create a powerful cannabis presence, which is becoming recognized as a high-quality producer and a unique business model that has unprecedented growth potential. They've released Stolo Hayes and Mac Daddy. Red Market Brand launched on June 21, 2021 on National Indigenous Peoples Day. Their logo is the symbol for prosperity in Anishinaabe tradition. The company brings Canadians another way to support First Nations communities. The Red Market applies their collective knowledge and wisdom, combined with modern cannabis expertise, to cultivate and support Indigenous communities. Through Red Market, founder and CEO Isadora Day believes that true Indigenous nationhood can be achieved by striving in every way for the development of healthy, wealthy Indigenous communities. Red Market acknowledges and respects their roots by devoting a portion of their profits to creating sustainable First Nation community health and wealth. Exceptional cannabis isn't the only thing J Bud's cannabis is working for. The family has a history of working on environmental cleanup projects in the Canadian North and works hard to ensure limits on the environmental impact of all activities that J Bud's is involved with. As an Indigenous owned company, they encourage a diverse working environment and have implemented training programs to encourage professional development for all staff. A family owned and operated micro cultivation facility in Summerland. Brothers Noah and Dylan Johnson worked together to lead the cultivation team. Having grown up together off the grid in the Northwest Territories, the brothers have a strong connection and they cultivate the crops with care and attention. Harvests are hang dried and slow cured, and all stages, including hanging, drying, trimming, and storage, happen in carefully controlled environments. Where the OZ is located, in the Okanagan Valley of BC, we live and work within the unceded territory of the Silic Okanagan people. And I would say the same thing, so where the Cannabis Podcast is produced is within the unceded territory of the Silic Okanagan people. From the Cannabis Infused Studio in the Clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. And we're going to stay with my buddy David Wiley at OkanaganZ.com for our second story of the day. And this is big news because we've been talking about this for a long while. The fact that... Health Canada had not yet started the review of the Cannabis Act, which was promised in the legalization and was set to begin at year at the beginning, or rather the end of year number three. Well, we're almost at the end of year number four now. <laughs> but I'm pleased to say it has begun. And here's a story from David Wiley on the man heading up the long-awaited legislative review of the federal cannabis file. He is highly regarded for speaking truth to power. His name is Morris Rosenberg. Morris earned the Order of Canada distinction on November 19, 2015, and was the epitome of an effective and ethical public servant, highly regarded for speaking truth to power, says his bio on the Governor General of Canada site. It notes he was recognized for his effective and ethical leadership as a senior public servant. On Thursday, the federal government held a press conference in Ottawa to announce the launch of the Legislative Review of the Cannabis Act, a mandatory review of cannabis legislation that's now overdue by nearly a year. With the September 22nd launch of the review, a report is due to the House of Commons within 18 months. Initially, the review was to have a narrow scope looking into public health, Indigenous issues, and youth use. However, the upcoming review will now be much more inclusive, says Minister of Health Jean-Yves Duclos. The scope is very broad. All views will be welcomed, he says. Now the review will encompass cannabis industry concerns too, such as the federal excise tax and current caps on THC and edibles. It will examine the economic, social, and environmental impacts of legalization. Mr. Rosenberg will have a difficult task, says Duclos. Rosenberg will head up a panel of experts yet to be named. The long-serving senior civil servant has been a federal deputy minister with the Department of Justice, Health, and Foreign Affairs. He's been involved during transformative moments in history, says his bio. He oversaw anti-terrorism legislation in the aftermath of 9-11, coordinated the federal response to the H1N1 crisis, and led foreign affairs through a period of global power rebalancing and upheaval in the Middle East. 
Rosenberg served as president and CEO of the Pierre Elliott's Trudeau Foundation from 2014 to 2018. The foundation is an independent and nonpartisan charity. Liberal MP Nathaniel Erskine-Smith, who co-chairs the All-Party Cannabis Caucus, also spoke at the news conference. We have been in many ways world leaders in advancing sensible drug policy and legalization and regulation of cannabis is an example of that, he said. But we didn't get it perfect. We didn't get it exactly right for the first time. A wide-scale public consultation process will be part of the review, including the public, governments, indigenous peoples, youth, marginalized and racialized communities, cannabis industry representatives, and medical cannabis users, as well as experts in health, substance use, criminal justice, and law enforcement. And there is a survey related to this review of the Cannabis Act. I have posted a link to that survey with the show notes, and I encourage everybody in Canada to fill out that survey. Let's give them all of the information required. And as I saw pointed out in in a thread that I was reading about this, one person went through and just said higher dosage of edibles was the answer to all the questions. And another person commented, you know, that's not really helpful. (laughs) That's just going to get that summary uh, thrown out in, in the review piece, and you really should be putting your honest answers to those questions. So, Morris Rosenberg is leading the review. Let's hope we get a a summary report in the 18 months as promised, and there are some significant changes to the cannabis legalization laws. And for our next story, we're going to mjbizdaily.com and a story by Matt Lamers, their international editor. Did you know Canada's most profitable cannabis businesses are (laughs) government-owned? The most profitable cannabis businesses in Canada are owned by various levels of government, according to MJ Biz Daily Research. At the same time, cumulative private sector losses easily exceed 16 billion Canadian dollars, led mostly by big producers such as Smith Falls, Ontario-based Canopy Growth, Edmonton, Alberta's Aurora Cannabis, and Tilray Brands, which has its executive offices in New York City. The largest companies are yet to become profitable, even though investors poured billions of dollars into the industry before and after legalization in 2018. The federal government shields Canadian producers against foreign competition in the medical cannabis market. Canada's federal government showered the same corporations with hundreds of millions of dollars in federal grants, money that does not have to be repaid. MJ Biz Daily examined financial reports for dozens of publicly traded and government-owned businesses. The research doesn't include privately owned companies, which generally do not disclose financial statements. The most profitable marijuana business in Canada thus far has been the Ontario Cannabis Store, OCS, which expects to earn roughly $262 million over a three-year period ending in March 2022, according to the province's fiscal outlook. The OCS, owned by the province and whose board is appointed by government, is the monopoly cannabis wholesaler for Ontario's 1,600-plus privately-owned retail stores. The next most profitable cannabis business in Canada is Société Québécois du Cannabis, SQDC, which has earned around $168 million in net income since legalization. The SQDC is Quebec's government-owned monopoly cannabis wholesaler and retailer. Unlike Ontario, Quebec does not allow privately owned cannabis stores, choosing instead to employ a government monopoly over all retail sales, including online. The BC Liquor Distribution Branch, LDB, whose operations include cannabis wholesale and some retail in British Columbia, is the third most profitable business. The government entity has earned roughly $36 million in net income from its cannabis business, according to its recent annual report. New Brunswick province-owned Cannabis wholesale retailer Cannabis NB has also reported healthy income. Cannabis NB is estimated to see cumulative net income reach $31 million for 2021 through 2122. And together, the four government-owned corporations pulled in just under $500 million in net income for their provinces. The government-owned cannabis businesses remit their profits back to their respective provinces. In the case of the SQDC, all revenue after cost is entirely remitted to the Ministère de Finance in the form of a dividend. The dividend is then reinvested, mainly in cannabis-related prevention efforts and research. In addition, SQDC collects consumer and excise tax revenue, estimated at $195 million. In Ontario, OCS profits also end up back in public hands. In its annual report, the OCS said it's proud of its financial contributions that support important public services, particularly throughout the COVID-19 pandemic at a time when frontline services have been essential to the economic and social health of our province. Amanda Winton, OCS spokesperson, said the organization is a self-funded, revenue-generating government business enterprise 
whose annual revenues are included in Ontario's public accounts. Unlike cannabis businesses owned by Canadian governments, private sector profits have been few and far between. Cannabis producers face stiff government regulations but have made numerous mistakes of their own, such as losing hundreds of millions of dollars on bad greenhouse investments, selling less than 20% of their production since adult use legalization, destroying vast quantities of inventory, massive overproduction. Not all large producers have faced those challenges. One of the most successfully federally licensed mass producers has been Delta British Columbia-based Pure Sun Farms, a subsidiary of Florida-headquartered vegetable grower Village Farms International. Village's Canadian cannabis business has approximately broken even on a net income basis over the past couple of years. Cannabis producer Redican reported an annual profit before it was acquired by Quebec-based Hexocorp in 2021. However, Redican, now a Hexo subsidiary, lost $91,000 in its latest quarter, ending April 2022. Decibel Cannabis reported a $1 million in net income in its financial year, ending December 31, 2021. And Tilray has reported profitable quarters, but not yet annually. Well, now we know. <laughs> the biggest money makers in cannabis to this date after legalization, and I guess it's no surprise, it's the government. If you're like a lot of cannabis executives I talk to, you know the struggle. Finding the right talent in this industry is not easy. Hiring in the cannabis industry is complicated. And the traditional jobs boards aren't going to tell you everything you need to know about a candidate. Are they bad? Are they reliable? Do they really know their stuff? That's why leaders at the top cannabis companies turn to Vangst. Vangst provides all the tools you need to make the right cannabis hires from one central intuitive dashboard. Whether you're looking for on-demand temporary employees or seasoned executives, Vangst is your one-stop shop to find qualified, ready-to-go workers that are the right fit for your company. Visit Vangst.com today. That's V-A-N-G-S-T dot com to learn more about Vangst gigs, vetted and marketplace products, and find out why we are proud to work in cannabis. Government. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Go to the corner. On Call of Our Corner today, we are featuring another one from BC Black. This is Mint Cream Cake, which was crafted by Doonesbury Farms. And we'll give you a little information on Doonesbury Farms as well as BC Black. And I'm pretty impressed as soon as I pop the bag. Mmm, very, very aromatic. In fact, they say that in the description of this. Let's give you that. Mint cream cake is what we're talking about here. This was grown by Doonesbury Farms and bred by Seed Junkie Genetics. It's a cross of two cannabis classics, Kush Mints and Wedding Cake. A strong indica, mint cream cake showcases pale mossy green flowers with dark green and purple highlights and amber pistils throughout, covered in a generous coating of trichomes. Well, let's pull out the jeweler's loop. Then let's test some of the marketing. As I pull out the jeweler's loop, oh, definitely. Oh, my, my, my. This is very frosty. So pale, mossy green flowers with dark green. Oh, and there's the purple accents. Wow. Excellently described. The nose is described as creamy vanilla cake overpowered by strong skunk. <laughs> In other words, this flower is extremely pungent. And I have to say that, oh, when I opened up the bag, it just, bam, smacked me in the face first thing. Mm, absolutely a delicious aroma. Nice looking bud. Well trimmed. I uh, don't have any issues with how that has been done. Uh, it's good. Give it a bit of a squeeze. Get a bit more of that aroma off of it. What's the details on it? The THC ranges from 24 to 30%. Uh, your primary terpenes and terpenes at about 1.94%. The primary ones, Delta Limonene at 0.48%. Beta Caryophylline sitting at 0.36%. And Linalool at 0.29%. And I'm not surprised that there's uh, some Linalool in there because it's very aromatic. Your flavor is going to be citrus. Uh, maybe that comes from the Limonene. Pepper. Maybe that comes from the Beta Caryophylline. And Lavender, which probably comes from the little lul. And just a note from the folks at Doonesbury Farm, all their products are craft. As such, you can expect variations from batch to batch. 
Results listed are representative of the latest certificate of analysis and may differ from other batches, which is currently on the market. And Doonesbury Farms, let's give you a little bit of information on Doonesbury Farms before we strike this up. Nestled into the Thompson Nicola Valley, Doonesbury Farms is bringing to the market the same top tier BC bud their legacy master grower has produced for years. Grown in a cocoa soil mix using LED lighting, their potent flowers win you over based on aesthetics alone. And this produces amazing trichome density possible and enables Doonesbury to produce consistent premium flowers crop after crop. Slow and steady wins the race when it comes to Doonesbury's proprietary curing system. The biological process of curing is done with the utmost care and time in mind to ensure your top shelf cannabis meets the standards of the sophisticated client. And I have to agree, what I saw on the cured bud, very, very nice. Uh, really nice and nuggy. And again, the aroma that came off of this was just absolutely astounding. So now we know it smells pretty good. And it looks pretty good. Let's see what it tastes like and the effect it has with mint cream cake and the THC on this guy sitting at 26.2%. I better power up the crafty so I'm ready to do that when it's time. I have taken my first hit of the joint. Mm. And as usual, I'm not picking up a lot of flavors in the joint. Sometimes I do get some of those. I guess there's a bit of a citrus there. Oh, definitely there's some of that limonene, some citrus notes and some of those floral notes on the intake. Nothing so much on the outtake, but I never seem to pick up any of those subtle things when they're coming <laughs> off. Now, I will advise I am coming off a bit of a cold for this last week. That accounts for why my voice may sound like it's a little coldy. And I'm hoping that that's not going to result in a little bit of coughing because I've had a bit of the cough through the cold. Not COVID. <laughs> Still have my full taste of sense and smell. Clearly, it was a cold that hit me this last week. All right. There's a couple hits of the mint cream cake. Oh, my. Mm. <laughs> uh, first hit of the day, which is always a good opportunity for a true cultivar corner to see what this weed is going to do for me. And I have to say, with those first couple of tokes, She's coming on. I'm starting to feel those happy eyes coming in. Mm, this group of terpenes, this terpene profile kind of really hits me. Delta limonene, beta caryophylline, and little lul all wrapped up in a nice, flavorful, aromatic package. Smooth smoke. I got lots of nice white ash coming off of that joint. And now my Crafty Plus is ready. Let's see what this stuff tastes like. Oh, wow. <laughs> as you've heard me say many, many times before, as soon as I pick up that craft deer after, after having the joint, the amount of flavor is just astonishing. Mmm, definitely those citrus notes, lots of the floral, and some hints of the peppers, especially on the uh, exhale. Oh, and here it comes. Oh, yeah, there they are. And here come the happy eyes. <laughs> that sense of euphoria to get my day started. Mm -mm -mm. Now, the lineage on this, as we've already talked about, Cushmints and Wedding Cake. Three and a half grams, THC SSA at 26.2. Those terpenes, uh, total terpenes at 1.94. I definitely like the taste of this better through the crafty. Mm. So here you have another legacy grower in British Columbia coming to the market, another master grower putting his work forward. And I think the folks at Doonesbury Farms are doing a pretty good job. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> I do love being high. And mint cream cake from BC Black and the folks at Doonesbury Farms has done just that, giving me a rather nice high to start the day. And another successful cultivar corner where we try some more BC weed. Mm. BC Bud is coming back to prominence 
and I think you're going to see it just explode in the next little while. Hmm, another good entry from BC Black. Mint cream cake. Ah, a nice high to start my day. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. This is the Cannabis Podcast. Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed, you probably have, on every package of legal cannabis that you have purchased since legalization on uh, October 17, 2018, uh, that package has had some words down at the bottom of it which never really made sense to any of us, and that is, no expiry date has been determined. How is that even possible? We know that weed can't last forever. (laughs) It has to have an expiry date of some form. There have been some studies, and we talked about it a little bit in, in a couple of episodes, where it was figured out it's probably about a year. But anyways, uh, I took a course from Cannabis Training University some time ago, and they continued to send me pieces of information to, I, I guess, to make me take the course again. <laughs> I don't know, but some of it is pretty valuable and, and is useful information and is publicly available, so that means I can share it with you, and that is this one. How long does weed stay good for? Keeping your weed fresh for a long time is easy if you follow these best storage practices. Although weed can last for months without a significant loss in potency, weed can go bad fast if you're not careful. The guide gives you the 401 on how long properly stored weed can last, factors that affect the quality of your bud, the signs of bad weed, and tips for storing weed and keeping it fresh for longer. Many cannabis users search online for how long is weed good for. Under the best storage conditions, the typical cannabis shelf life ranges from 6 months to 1 year. Of course, this depends on many factors, including the product type, storage location, and other factors. Weed potency can go down over time. For example, one study found that weed loses 16% of its TAC potency in one year, 26% in two years, and 34% in three years, 41% after four years of storage. A fresh snug with a strong aroma, flavor, and potency can turn old over time into a dry, odorless, and low-potency flower. While it may not provide the best smoking experience, old weed may still be good to consume. We know weed can get old, but can it go bad? Yes, weed can turn ugly if you're not careful. Storing weed in areas with excessive humidity could lead to mold, which can be harmful if consumed. Do not smoke moldy weed. Otherwise, old and low-potency weed would taste harsh and would not give you the best experience. Is your weed still good to use? Well, we've all been there. You find an old nug and don't know if it's good or not. It's definitely not fresh weed, but is it bad? Here's some signs your weed has gone bad. Mold. Consuming moldy weed is not good. Mold can develop in environments that are too humid. Mold can have a white or gray powdery look and smell musty. How your cannabis feels in your hands can tell you a lot about its quality. If it's too wet and spongy, it has a higher risk of mold. If it's too dry and crumbles in your fingers, you know it's lost a lot of its potency and maybe a harsh smoke. Weed is supposed to have a pleasant aroma, whether fruity, sweet, earthy, or skunky. If it smells musty, do not consume it. It likely has mold. Know the factors that can affect how long weed stays good is essential. Cannabis growers spend months vegetating and flowering the plants to produce dense and pungent cannabis buds with tons of trichomes. Excessive humidity can wreak havoc on your buds, creating the perfect breeding ground for mold and bacteria. But too little humidity can also hurt by drying out your nugs. Under optimal conditions, cannabis buds should remain between 54 and 63% relative humidity. Many people ask how long does weed stay good in a Ziploc bag? It can remain good for many weeks depending on how you handle and store it, but plastic bags have a static charge that can attract the bud's trichomes. Edibles such as cannabis-infused brownies, cookies, and gummies should be kept in their original packaging and stored in a cool, dry, and dark place. Gummies and hard candies may be more prone to heat damage than other edibles like baked goods. Cannabis concentrates can be stored in glass or silicone containers. Vape cartridges containing cannabis oil should be stored in a dry, dark, and cold place and kept upright to prevent oil from spilling. Many people search online for how long does weed carts stay good. In optimal storage conditions, vape cartridges can be good for six months to one year. And there's some information on storage from CTU. If you're interested in cannabis training, you can maybe check them out. Uh, I've included the link to the story, of course, with the show notes. And the debate goes on. How long does weed actually last? Let's finish off this episode with another event, a cannabis event, that happened here in the Okanagan just last week at the Hotel El Dorado, actually right next door at the Menteo Resort. It was 200 cannabis professionals gathered in Kelowna at an event that was organized by StratCan. 
and it brought together a whole mix of producers, retailers, and ancillary services. And guess what? This is another story from OkanaganZ.com. Stratcon founder David Brown tells the OZ that direct delivery was a hot topic at the September 26th event, where about 30 BC micros attended. People are excited about direct delivery, he says. This gives retailers and processors a chance to meet eye-to-eye. The Growing Relationships Industry event has been in the works for over a year, but was cancelled at one point by COVID-19 restrictions. Brown says one of the challenges in the legal cannabis industry is a lack of unity and a lack of organization. This amazing industry event has brought together an array of cannabis professionals, he says. While the B.C. government wasn't represented, a federal government rep from Innovation, Science and Economic Development Canada attended, and attendees also discussed the excise tax and edible limits and a lot more, and I was one of those attendees. It was another event in the beautiful Okanagan, and the Okanagan just shone that day. I mean, the sun was out. It was a beautiful day. The outdoor patio right beside the conference room where the event was was busy all day. I think there were a number of people who spent most of the time out on the patio (laughs) using it as a consumption lounge rather than inside with the conversation. And there was lots of great conversation. Basically, they were split into three different groups. There was the micros, the macros, the processors, and the retailers. So I guess that's four groups, isn't it? (laughs) Well, you'll forgive me my math, but it was a really interesting event. I was pleased to be there. One of the major sponsors was BC Black. The folks from BC Black, including Janine Davis, who's basically the running things, she was there along with her whole team, and they have such energy. It was just a blast to get to know more of them. Jeff and Sherry Oben from Smoker Farms were there. I met Kyra from Pineapple Buds down in Oliver. I had a chat with Nasco from Sweetgrass Cannabis. Just a whole bunch of different people and a really exciting event. It was, again... Just fabulous to be sharing in a cannabis event with such a diverse group of people. Todd, Todd was from Caslow, and he brought some of his outdoor weed. And this was the the only one, I think he said, out of 26 different phenos they tried that actually harvested in time for them to harvest in Caslow, which is a fairly late harvest time. <laughs> and he, he had a big jar of it, and he was just giving out samples. I partook of some of his samples. <laughs> it was it was great. I'm looking forward to more of them. They're getting to be, fortunately, more frequent. And really an exciting time to be able to talk directly to the producers, talk to the uh, processors, and for them to get a direct connection to us, the retailers, and be able to build that relationship and make it stronger. That's just going to be better for everybody's access to cannabis. So congratulations to David Brown at Stratcan. A fabulous job. David did the emceeing of the whole thing. He basically did it from start to finish and did an excellent job. Well done, David. I'll keep you informed should there ever be another one that was definitely worth attending. My boss, Tark was there along with a couple of other Spirit Leaf owners and a whole lot of other retailers. It was a great day talking about cannabis in the Okanagan. Let me finish off this episode with a comment on some recent feedback that I received. I want to thank you, Stephen. Stephen is an expat living in Japan and sent me, well, let's say a rather long email. (laughs) 13 pages is what Stephen sent me. Really appreciate the feedback, Stephen. Stephen has listened to all 105 episodes of the Cannabis Podcast. He's been all the way through. He had some opinions that he wanted to express with me. And Stephen, let me say, don't worry about me. I am just fine. There are other things other than cannabis in my life. But the emphasis on this podcast will remain cannabis. And that's not likely to change in the future. But thank you for your comments. I really do appreciate them. And I hope you continue to be a listener. If you ever have a comment on anything you hear on the Cannabis Podcast, please send a note to info at CannabisPodcast.com. Thank you so much for being a listener. I really appreciate your support and the fact that you are here. And if you would like to support the podcast, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash Cannabis Podcast And if you like what you hear and you feel so inclined, like others have, you can buy me a doobie. And that wraps it up for episode 107 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. 
Hey there, my name is Leah Babrudi, and I'm the founder and host of Canna Chicks Podcast, where I discuss cannabis, psychedelics, and other natural medicines. I not only interview people who use them as treatment for different conditions, but also the entrepreneurs who share their knowledge on how they built their businesses. If this sounds interesting to you, give my show a listen. I'm sure you'll learn something that'll surprise you.